All right, welcome to Chestnut Hill Cemetery for uh, a unique and different tour than we've done in years past. Um, the current uh, crisis has uh, caused us to relook on how we uh, do this tour that we've been doing for um, several decades here at Chestnut Hill Cemetery. Uh, and wanting to try and do something this year, we've come up with a, a virtual tour and uh, recording it and videotaping it. Um, so Chestnut Hill Cemetery was founded in 1863. It is an example of what's called a garden style cemetery. Uh, these were cemetery types that were extremely popular in the 19th century, in the 1800s. These cemeteries were designed with the landscape in mind. Uh, they often had winding pathways, elaborate plantings, or they were situated uh, with the rolling terrain. And one can see that when you walk through the grounds of Chestnut Hill Cemetery. It's situated at the very top of a hill that has this wonderful uh, panoramic view of the surrounding area. And that was uh, done um, purposely. It was purposely part of the design. And it was part of a design concept that dates back uh, to the, uh, the early 1800s. Um, cemeteries before this time period uh, were often during the colonial period in churchyards uh, or on family burial grounds on farms uh, throughout the area but by the early 1800s many of these old uh, churchyards had become quite crowded and so society was looking for different ways uh, to handle the dead and what sprang from that were these garden style cemeteries that were situated on the outskirts of town bringing in the landscape as part of the uh, the uh, the design concept. The oldest grave marker here in the cemetery uh, predates the formation of the, uh, the burial ground in 1863. Uh, it's from the 1830s. It's located at the top of the hill and there are a number of burials here from the 18, um, uh, 40s and 50s era as well and they were most likely people that were buried elsewhere, buried in some of those um, earlier church burial grounds uh, that were located in the area and when Chestnut Hill Cemetery opened uh, they removed the remains of those loved ones uh, to, the, um, uh, to this location. Uh, the way that the, the plots are situated are also different. They're arranged as family groupings, and that also becomes very apparent as you walk through the burial ground here. Um, you'll see many families, uh, many generations of one family in some of these plots, um, and some of them going back to, again, to the founding of the cemetery in 1863. So on the tour today, you're going to encounter a number of individuals portraying people from East Brunswick's past, giving first-person narrations about their life, and showing artifacts and photographs to help tell their story. Uh, and we hope that you enjoy the tour. I'm Charlotte Osborne Herzig. I hear this year you're celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage. In June of, of 1914, I was chosen to be chairman of the Old Bridge Suffrage League. Old Bridge, which was an area of East Brunswick, went wild over suffrage. Our first meeting was held at the Old Bridge Baptist Church, and the church was filled to overflowing and had the most enthusiastic assemblage in the church's history. Not only women, but men were eager to enroll in our league as well. Cards were passed throughout the audience to sign so that a record of those in favor of universal suffrage could be presented to the different assemblymen and senators showing the views of their constituents when the bill came up again in the state legislature. The Oldsbridge League and other suffrage leagues in the state were instrumental in eventually getting New Jersey legislature to ratify the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. On February 9, 1920, New Jersey became the 29th state to ratify the amendment for women's suffrage. And on August 18, 1920, the requisite 36th state, Tennessee, ratified the 19th Amendment. It was meant to give the women in the United States the right to vote under the U.S. Constitution. Well, I should tell you a little bit about myself and how I ended up here. I was born in New York in 1856 
and I came to this area after my parents saw an advertisement for the Conover Home Boarding School and enrolled me in it. The Conover Boarding School was located on River Road just behind us in, uh, through these trees. It was, uh, the school was established by Miss Ann Eliza Conover in 1849 and the residence was enlarged in 1865 for the preparation of boarding pupils. The location of this school was very pleasant. The characteristics of the house and its surroundings justified the name Home Boarding School. And the care bestowed by Miss Ann Eliza Conover made us feel like members of a common household, and it took the place of our respective homes to a remarkable degree. I became a teacher at the boarding school after I graduated. And when Ann Eliza Conover passed away in 1899, she left me her entire estate, which was valued at from twenty-five to forty thousand dollars in eighteen ninety-nine, except three hundred dollars which she bequeathed to Chestnut Hill Cemetery. The value of the estate in your time would be about a million dollars. Her relatives were completely left out of the will and contested it. But they ultimately lost and I continued to operate the school through nineteen tens. I married Herman Herzig, whose two daughters were students of mine. When the school eventually closed, the building became a summer vacation retreat that was owned by Jean Bickle, who advertised fun activities like swimming in the South River. In the 1950s, the building suffered a devastating fire, but the front portion still stands today on River Road and is a lawyer's office. The students of Conover Boarding School purchased a stained glass window in memory of Ann Eliza Conover, and it is still hanging at the Baptist Church today. I passed away in 1938 at the age of 82, and I'm buried here with my husband Herman, Herman Herzig, and Miss Ann Eliza Conover. She is next to us. Our tombstone faces the Conover Home Boarding School that we have many fond memories of. I'm Congressman T. Frank Appleby. The T stands for Theodore. I was born in the village of Old Bridge on October 10th, 1864. I then moved to Asbury Park, where I was mayor for two terms from 1908 to 1912. I also ran the T. Frank Appleby Company, one of the largest real estate offices on the Jersey coast. I was also congressman for the 3rd District of New Jersey, which included Middlesex, Monmouth, and Ocean Counties. I ran for Congress in the 1920 election and won. I am a Republican and what was known as a dry. In other words, I stood for square in the, for the enforcement of the 18th Amendment, or as most of you might know, prohibition. I was also against any modification of the Volstead Act, which enforced the 18th Amendment. I believe alcohol threatens the institution of the family and drunkenness results in a rise of crime, poverty, and violence. I feel strongly about prohibition as my father, Theodore Appleby, had a three day long stay in the local Spencer Tavern and Hotel. He was so intoxicated that Miss Spencer called the Justice of the Peace had someone hold up my father and they were married. She also wanted to inherit his fortune. He died a day after their marriage of alcohol poisoning. My brothers and I sued Miss Spencer, but she died in a train accident before the case was resolved. I was elected for Congress again in the 1924 election, supported especially by women and the Anti-Saloon League, ASL for short. However, I never got to serve my second term. I passed away on December 15th, 1924. I am buried here with my wife, Miss Alice Hoffman. We had three boys, Stuart, Harry, and Theodore. Stuart followed in my footsteps and became a congressman himself. 
You'll also notice at the entrance of the cemetery, my, my name is inscribed on a plaque. That is because I helped donate to this very cemetery. Welcome, I'm Luella Jolly Brown. I was born in 1876 and my husband Howard and my daughter Eleanor are buried here with me. Once, I was once the postmaster of Old Bridge. Uh, I started working for the post office when I was 17 years old, helping my father, Louis Jolly, run the post office. We had a general store, so it was a handy location to have the post office. Um, we delivered mail to rural uh, East Brunswick, which was mostly farms and forests, by horse and wagon. Here's a picture of me in my postal uniform and the, the horse and buggy that we used. In 1896, the United States government instituted rural free delivery. That's the RFD that you would see on the wagon. This is a postal stamp of that. Prior to that, farm families had to travel long distances to get their mail or hire um, services to, at a high expense to bring their mail. Now, um, the village shop owners were worried that the rural free delivery would take business away from their shops. They thought farm families would no longer visit their shops because we also delivered the Sears catalog and other catalogs. My great 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 granddaughter has told me that there's a company called Amazon that you can have them on your hand or on a table and you can order anything you want and it'll come to your door in one or two days. This is an example of a letter that would look when we would deliver it to these rural uh, locations. This just says Doe Run, so it may have been a stream, uh, it could have been a grove of trees, it could have been a river, because there weren't actual designated street names. From 1877 through 1960, the um, post office was located in general stores owned by two families, the Appleby family and my family, the Jollies. So that was for a hundred years before they actually started building post offices. In 1935, when I was 59 years old, I was finally honored with the title of postmaster. I worked there for 11 years until I was 70 years old, at which time I was able to retire and receive a pension. My great-great-granddaughter has told me that the post office is in trouble and may be closed. I hope that they continue to deliver mail to rural families and pe people who live off-grid. Thank you so much for visiting me. My name is Henrietta Wright. I was born on February 18, 1852. I had two brothers and a sister. Um, and me and uh, my family moved to this area from New York City in the 1850s, where I grew up and went to school. I later became an author and wrote several books um, that became well known. They're still available for sale online on iTunes, believe it or not. Um, some of the books include um, stories in American history about colonial America through the Revolutionary War. Um, we have another children's book um, called Little Folk in the Green. This book is about an adventure a little boy took from the sea to the sky. We have another children's stories in American literature. This became a part of 
um, kind of curriculum for children in school. Um, so later in life, I you know, published a lot of these books when I was living with my mother, who was a widow at that point. I passed away at 47, um, and kind of a sensational story from my family was about six and a half years after I passed away, uh, my mother was living on Costman Street in this home, um, and she was murdered. Um, it became a kind of terrifying story and event for this town. Uh, men would sleep with guns in their beds after that, fearful that these attackers would return. Um, the story goes, um, people came to her home to try and rob her, potentially for my royalty checks from the books. Um, at that point, you know, my mother was 86 and, and blind and could barely hear. They suspect she actually recognized the people that came to rob her, which is why they later murdered her in her home. And she was later found by a young boy uh, by the, the bay. Um, so really terrible story. Um, there were uh, rewards posted in the newspaper for $500 to find her attackers. Uh, who they never, they never found them. They suspect it was people that lived in town that she recognized. Um, there were three people that left the very next day and never returned, so it was really suspicious. A month after her death, they auctioned our family home with everything in it. Um, and that was kind of the end of the story um, for my mother, so it was a very scary thing that happened in town. Um, but either way, this is where uh, my entire family is buried. My, my mother, who I mentioned, Rachel Wright, is here. Um, as well as my uh, two brothers and sisters, none of which live beyond 20 years old, um, as well as my father and myself. Thank you for visiting. Hello, my name is Henry Silcox, and I'm in the cemetery, but I'm not buried here. I was a gravestone cutter back in the 1820s. This is me during my wedding portrait in 1819 when I married the beautiful Isabella Reed Hull Silcox. She's a gorgeous woman, isn't she? We had 10 children. One, two, eight. That's ten. So I was a lot better at home, apparently, than I was in the gravestone carving shop where I worked in New Brunswick for apparently, oh, I'd say about 27 years or more, carving gravestones. I died before this cemetery was founded in 1863, but my legacy still stands here. Off to my left, are two stones that were carved by my sons, James and Gabriel Silcox, one of which uh, is actually signed at the bottom, which was a common practice in those days. And um, the uh, Rogers obelisk behind me, where my sign is located, was also carved and carted up this very steep hill for the Rogers family. And that too was carved by my sons, James and Gabriel. These stones are carved in marble, which was very fashionable in the 19th century. But when I started carving stones as an apprentice in the 18 teens in Jamestown and then Somerville and finally in New Brunswick, I was working in a material that's common in most early burial grounds in New Jersey, and it is sandstone. You may have seen it in some of the older grounds, that dark, brooding brown color. And back in those days, Things were always done with the basics that had been utilized for millennia. Mallets and chisels. In order to get these things, we had to use templates. This would be an early example of a gravestone from the early 1700s using mortality imagery. And you can see right here that it's a very simple pattern and the lettering usually took the longest part to do. When I started carving, I was using sandstone material, as I mentioned before. It was still fashionable. 
but it quickly faded into the use for marble, which are the materials that you see behind me. It was more fashionable because it was white and it stood out very well against the uh, green cemetery backgrounds. And in these days, uh, in, those, in the days of the early days of gravestone carving, mortality was the funerary fashion. It shifted over to something called salvation imagery by the mid 1700s and it used winged cherubs or soul effigies. And when I started carving, the last phase of gravestone carving in America, or great gravestone carving in America, was the neoclassical phase. That was represented with obelisks like you see behind me, urns, funerary urns, weeping willow trees, figures in togas mourning over sarcophagi. And when I started carving, like I said, that was the, those were the funerary fashions of the time. Um, my shop was located around Nielsen Street, uh, right by the Raritan River, uh, which is a good place for, car uh, for bringing in stone in those places. Uh, stone is very heavy, so you want to be by a waterway to bring it into your shop. And uh, as I said, I carved for about 20-something years, leaving the business behind to my sons James and Gabriel. And they continued the business until 1876 when they sold it off to the Kilbourne Company. And this is an advertisement that the Kilbournes actually put in the paper of the old shop. Eventually, uh, fashions changed again and things became a lot more sentimental. So you found a lot of the mortality imagery was a spiritual thing. Uh, the salvation imagery continued with the spiritual aspects of the deceased. And finally, you had the more sentimental things carved by, um, in the neoclassical, simple funerary urns, in memory of, replaced, here lies the body, and things of that nature. Uh, by the time I passed away in 1846, the industry had begun to change. Even granite was becoming more popular for use as a stone cutting material, and it remains the choice for gravestone carving today. I'm buried at Willow Grove Cemetery. This is a picture of the family plot. And despite all the ostentatious and ornamental carving that we had to do over the life of the firm, uh, we have very simple, plain gravestones that were buried underneath. Hi, I'm Frank Hoffman. When I lived in this town, I was a telegraph operator for the Pennsylvania Railroad. In 1899, my wife and I, Ada, we moved to South Amboy, where I took a job with the Raritan River Railroad. I became the superintendent of that railroad, and I was able to make that railroad the most profitable railroad per mile in the country. It was a job that I loved. I had that most of my life, working on the Raritan River Railroad. Yeah, during the silent film era, Many silent films were filmed using the Raritan River Railroad, the cars. I, I had a chance to be a stuntman in a way, piloting the trains that were used in the smash-ups and derailments to create the dramatic scenes in the movies. One of the films that I participated in was in 1914 in The Perils of Pauline, and there was another film in 1916 called The Juggernaut, and I was at the controls of the trains as they crashed. In South Amboy, I ran a tobacco shop, which became a popular gathering place for local politicians. I was very interested in politics. I was a member of the Republican Party, and my son Harold found an interest in politics as well, and meeting all of the people who would gather at my tobacco shop. Harold would uh, go into politics. He'd grow up to become a uh, congressman and also the governor of New Jersey. And in 1923, I served as the Postmaster General in South Amboy. My son Harold G. Hoffman would go on to serve in Congress and he became the governor of New Jersey. He won the uh, governorship in 1934 in that election and served from 1935 to 
1938. He was the youngest governor in the country at the time, the youngest governor ever to serve. He was also governor during the Lindbergh trial. And Harold believed that Bruno Hauptmann did not act alone in the Lindbergh case and that his execution was going to be too swift and that co-conspirators in the case would never be discovered if Hauptmann was executed too swiftly. Now, Hauptmann would not describe who his co-conspirators were. He wouldn't reveal that information. And Harold opened his own, his own investigation into the Lindbergh case in order to try and uncover who else was involved in that kidnapping. It was a very controversial decision that he made, and it cost him a, the opinion of the Republican Party in the state. He was seen as being a political opportunist when, in fact, he was trying to solve what was the crime of the century. Being a member of the Republican Party, Harold collected elephants. During his lifetime, he collected over a thousand elephants that were presented to him because he was, there was the symbol of the Republican Party. Elephant figurines I'm talking about, not actual elephants. And the figurines collection was donated to the East Brunswick Museum. So the museum, which is not far from this cemetery, houses a big portion of the Hoffman elephant collection, and you can go and see it today. My wife Ada and I had four sons, Frank, Fletcher, Harold, and Donald. Ada's father, my father-in-law, was the famous painter James Crawford Tom, who was buried not far from where my resting place is. Ada and her siblings were often used by her father in his paintings as models. And there are many paintings where I can see my wife's, as a, her face as a child, as the model for the people who are portrayed in the paintings. It's a very interesting thing for us to have in our household, the paintings that her father did that are very well known throughout the world. And I know that it's my wife who served as the model when he painted them. James Crawford Tom's father, James Tom, was the Scottish sculptor who worked on Trinity Church in New York City. And his sculpture is also housed in the Royal Collection in Scotland. So we have a lot of artistic depth in the history of our family. It's something that I'm very proud of. I passed away in 1948 at the age of 82. I'm just so happy that you took this time to come and visit with me today and I could tell you a little bit about my life, my family, and our story here. Thank you. My name is James El Ellsworth Sylvester. I grew up in this neighborhood. Around this time of year, the young boys in the neighborhood would be planning their pranks. The residents of the town would wake up the next morning and see their front gates missing, signs around town misplaced, and farm equipment ending up across town. When I was a little older, I got a job working for the local tile factory. I almost had one of my fingers cut off on the tile press. I also worked for Charles Lanson Grit Mill. When they were gone, I ran the operations for a while. I also married my sweetheart, Ada Hendrickson, on Thanksgiving 1917. Come 1918, I answered the call to service. In the Great War, or as you guys will know it, World War I. Along with the local boys, we, we, we boarded a train bound for Camp Dix, which is near Trenton, New Jersey. We had a big send off at the stations. Parents, townspeople, and school children all came to say their goodbyes and wave American flags while the train pulled out. On the way down to Trenton, we were greeted by many other people in neighboring towns and a, a, a lot of mothers did cry as they saw their sons board the train for the very last time. Soon after I arrived at Camp Dix for training, I was struck by the influenza and I died in October 
1918 at the age of 22. 1918 was the worst year for the, the flu epidemic. Young adults ranging from 21 to 29 were very susceptible to the influenza. There was a soldier that is buried in front of me here, Augustus Hillier, and we served at Camp Dix together and we were both born in this area and we both died from the influenza. We never saw the trenches in Europe and the war, as you will know, ended in 1918. And some of my items that we used during the war was our gas mask. In here we would have ground up peach pits to have the peach pits have an arsenic effect that would counteract the mustard gas the Germans used on us. Here is a picture of me before I was sent off to war. And these are some of the propaganda posters we used. Our boys need sock. Eat more oats and corn. Save the vegetables for us. And a pile of peach pits to encourage people to donate their peach pits back home here in the States. And of course, our boys over in Europe love their coffee. So we always had a can of coffee with us. Here are my two friends from the neighborhood that fought in the war with me. Augustus Hillier and Hal Russell. And they both died of the influenza in the camp. My name is Ida May Saren Layton, and I was born in 1890, and I am 28 years old when I passed away. I rest here with my husband Charles, who was born in 1878, and who died on March 5th, 1968. My husband Charles, alongside his two brother-in-laws, purchased the Clayton grist mill from his father, Charles Layton the Senior. In this grist mill, Farmers would come from all around to grind different grains for market. We were also known for taking dried corn and turning it into chicken food. The grist mill continued in operation until 1921, when we could not maintain the advances in technology for running a grist mill. The grist mill was located on the corner of Main Street and River Road. After it was closed down in 1921, it was converted into a bar which was known by some residents as Pete's Pizza. It later burnt down in 1970 and is now known as a vacant lot. Charles and I had two children together. Our daughter May was born in 1914 and our son Charles was born in 1917. Charles was born with severe birth defects and it was also included a club foot. I took my son Charles onto a train trip to see a specialist in Philadelphia. Unknown to me, several soldiers were carrying the Spanish influenza virus. It was there I picked it up. After returning from the train trip from Philadelphia, I died two days later from the, from the flu. I was in one of the chief demographic numbers as I was age 28 and I was one, and I'm considered one of the 675,000 people who died from this virus. My husband's father was very active in the volunteer fire department in Old Bridge. He bought the land and donated the land to the fire, volunteer firefighters to build a firehouse on. In 1906, the fire department built, got their first wagon, which was, and the neighbors, if there was a burning house, would come get the wagon to help take out the flames. I wish you all the best. Have a good day.
much of the information for this tour comes from the hard work of volunteers at the East Brunswick Museum, which is a great organization. Uh, the museum holds um, the, the story of East Brunswick through these artifacts and photographs, and the volunteers there uh, are very dedicated in preserving uh, East Brunswick's story. And for those that want to learn more about the history of this area, um, the museum is a great place to visit uh, to learn more uh, about our town. Thank you.